religious, I'm ceremonial, and just be filled with the Spirit. Maybe, you know what? Uh, a warehouse is a good thing. A warehouse is a good thing. It's a precious thing, isn't it? God to have His way in our hearts and our lives. He, he comes and lives in these little warehouses, doesn't He? These little vessels. Let's just sing this song here. Hallelujah. It's a song we all know so well. Hallelujah.
two hours, that's six hours, sir. <laughs> so you get the point. The closer you get to the front, the less I preach. <laughs> so we're glad to have the chairs. Glad to uh, have you here, too, especially. Uh, several told me that they were going to be out of town over the weekend. Uh, uh, vacation and paying extra gas for it. And uh, very glad to have everyone here. God is good. Irene, your friend's name. Bill. I thought it was Bill. Bill, glad to meet you. Glad to meet you. Your, your reputation precedes you, and uh, you were already well appreciated. And, and I appreciate uh, Will and Tara and the little ones. You guys drove a long way as well. God bless you for that. It's a long trip, I know that. God is good. This morning, what I want to talk about comes from the depth of my soul. It comes from, in a sense, why I wanted to start all over again. Um, I wanted a level of freedom in the spirit that where they got to move in the individual heart. There is group conformity. But usually the root of group conformity is fear. A lot of times it's not pulpit and intimidation. It's a lot of times it's fear we place on ourselves, expectations we think that other people expect of us. But what if you can have your own personal walk with God? Very personal, very intimate. Your own prayer life. Serving God is not intimidating. Coming to church is not intimidating if you know the Lord. So you're well acquainted with the Lord. So anything that's foreign to the Lord, foreign to his nature, foreign to his character, there's no threat. A lot of people will come to church for various reasons. I mean, I had one guy say to me, Jeff, man, I got so many tattoos. <laughs> God could care less. Come to church. Well, I want to, they got this machine and it costs so much money. I'm just doing these tattoos. That's why I always wear long sleeves. And uh, I baptized him and, and he wore long sleeves. I said, get those long sleeves off. We're all, we're all marked. We're all marked. We all uh, fall short of the glory of God. We're all going to make mistakes every day of our life, and that's why God in His wisdom knew that we would need help, His blood, His forgiveness. It, it, it's amazing that God creates man, man creates religion. God creates man, man creates religion. And why do we create religion? I think it's because we try to find comfort, and it's a false security, in form and ritual. And um, so the more form we have, the bigger the building, the prettier the building, it's not always the case. The more security we derive from other things. In Africa, we, I would preach under a banyan tree. In India, I preached in the jungle, and it was so dark, I don't know what my environment was. So I came in in the dark. We had a generator room and one little light over my head so I could read my notes. And when that light from that generator was on, it would go up and down with the generator engine. And all the bugs were going down my neck. <laughs> they hit the light and go right down my neck. And, um, and I had to compete with the monkeys. The monkeys were as loud as I was. That's pretty good. But there was something beautiful about that. There was something incredible about that. Uh, the, the, I had to fight religion harder there than I did anywhere else. America is fraught with, with religion. But in India, it's even worse. They worship 33 million different things, objects, inanimate, animate. And I was a white man. We'd gone to the jungles. And there in India, they have what they call a caste system. You're very familiar with that. And the darker the cast, the less, uh, the more inferior. The lighter the cast, the more superior. Don't ask me how people do this, but they do it. For some, they do it. Somehow some man creates some god, and all of a sudden you have superior and inferior. And I remember that the people would come up to me, and would crawl up to me in the jungle. And they would kiss my, uh, my feet, my shoes. And then they would have a little vial of water, and they would want me to bless it. And so I would, my translator was 
Papa Jonah because I couldn't pronounce his Indian name. So I called him Papa Jonah. And yeah, I tell him, please get him off, you know, get him off the ground. And we'll have to teach him a few things about, about, about the fact that it's level at the foot of the cross. It, it, it's, it's perfectly level. We all come to the cross naked, not in our best duds. We come to the cross naked. So I was like hospital. And that's really what a church is. I like a hospital because everybody has to wear a hospital gown. And if you've ever worn a hospital gown, nobody likes to have anybody walking behind them. <laughs> and we all have a backside. We all have a backside. So what I want to say today comes to my heart. So if you, I think it's verse 24. Romans 9, 24. Should be subject of any? Is that the one? Let's see. Uh, 9, 24. Even us whom he hath called out of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Keep reading. As he, as he saith also, and I see, I will call them my people, which are not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not, ye are not my people, there shall, there shall thy, there shall they be called the okay, children of the living God. Eight. Eight twenty-four. Sorry. Eight eighteen through twenty-four. <laughs> That's why you couldn't find it. <laughs> Eight eighteen through twenty-four. For I reckon, reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hey, stop there, just a second here. Paul is, is talking about the brevity of life, isn't he? I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Talking about the this body versus the glory of the next body. And he says, therefore, by looking forward to the next body, it really diminishes the suffering and the uncertainty of this life. So go ahead and read the next verse. So the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What do you suppose that means? For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. The word creature can be creature or creation. So the entire creation is waiting for the sons of God to manifest themselves. Well, first of all, who are the sons and daughters of God? We are, the Christian. Full manifestation doesn't take place in this life. It takes place in the next life, in a glorified body. The whole world is groaning because of the fall in the Garden of Eden. We've all been thrown into... Something that is compromised, it's limited, and skewed, and it's perverted. And we, we live in it like we like a fish in a fishbowl that gets darker and darker and more dirty. And we hardly realize that our environment is, is shadowed. It's shadowed because of the body we live in. It's just we're living in a big fishbowl. But God one day is going to come and he's going to take us out of our itty bitty little fishbowl called this body and sin and the limitations of our mind. And he's going to give us a brand new fishbowl, a glorified body. And it's not really a fishbowl. It's not an aquarium. It's an ocean. It's a vast world of love. A vast world of divine love. Read the next verse. For the creature is made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in both. Okay, I think we can stop right there. For the creature was made subject to vanity. That's also if you've got a Bible creation or creature. That's us. Creatures are those that have been created. So the creation or the creature was made subject to vanity. Who subjected us to vanity? Vanity here means futility, emptiness, <clears throat> uncertainty, limitation. Adam and Eve were not limited before the fall. They were little creators. <laughs> They were, the, they were bona fide sons and daughters of God, and they had the capacity to speak, and things would happen. Adam named all the animals based upon their characteristics. You're a monkey because you're a wily. You can climb trees. You're a fox because you're wise and stealthy. And he named all the animals. And he had a, a superior, godlike understanding and discernment. 
He was one with God. He was made in the very image of God. Not the flesh. The flesh is not made in the image of God. The flesh is made in the image of an animal. Feet like a, you know, feet like a bear, hands like a chimpanzee. But the inner man of Adam before the fall was godlike, unspoiled, non-fallen. But now we've been made subject to vanity. So we've been made subject to futility and vanity. You say, well, it's Adam's fault. Yes, yes. There has to be an antagonist. And there has to be a protagonist. The antagonist is the person that creates the problems. And the protagonist is the person that comes along and he's the hero and he cleans things up. So Adam fell. When he fell, it brought the entire human race into a fallen and a not-to-be condition. A wrong condition. A fallen state. We were made subject to vanity, you say, by Adam. Well, that's true. But did God know that Adam would fall? Yes, he did. So that's why God could say, I have created good, and I have created evil, evil for the day of destruction. Now, evil there is not a person. It's, it means actually calamity. And all calamitous individuals who create calamity and evil. So God, by the fall, subjected us to vanity, but if you notice what the next part of the stanza says, yet with a hope. Yet with a hope. So hope is something futuristic. You don't hope for something that you have. So hope is something that's futuristic. So there comes our word faith. Now, faith, the Bible says, works by love. So the more love we have, the more faith we have. So love isn't something that we acquire at, at birth. We're not naturally loving like God loves at birth. In fact, we don't love God at birth. We love ourselves. And, and, and you say, well, that's, you know, that's terrible. No, that's just who we are at birth. That's just the way it is. We're not born good. You know, the psychologists say that a child is born as a clean slate, and then mankind writes on them, creates them, creates who they are, depending on their environment or their advantages or disadvantages in life. And, and there is a lot to say about DNA and environment, but ultimately, leave a person alone and they will not go good. They have to be taught to keep their fingers out of the cookie jar. They have to be taught not to lie. They have to be taught not to have their way. We call it the terrible twos. But really, it's, it's, it's a wonderful age. I have five kids. Have, I still do. <laughs> yep, still do. And each one of those uh, times and phases in their life were wonderful. They were wonderful. But they, they didn't test your, uh, the parameters. They didn't test you. They're supposed to. They've got to grow wings. They've got to fly. So they have to test the parameters. They have to find out is mom and dad going to, who's going to have, who's going to have their way, this 27-pound uh, two-year-old, or are they going to, or the adult, who's going to have their way? And the child really wants the mom and dad to have their way, even though they protest. They, they find that they like the security and parameters. But there are parameters that are provided out of love, and there's parameters that are provided or foisted upon us. And we have to determine the difference as we grow more. Lord. The Bible says, perfect love casteth out all fear. And then the Bible describes what fear is. Fear hath torment. So God does not want us to be tormented. So perfect love casts out all fear. Wow! I'd love to live in that environment. And faith works by love. So faith is saying, I don't know about the future. I don't know about tomorrow. But I know who holds tomorrow. And I know he has complete control over the future. And I'm trusting him. Moses, after looking over his life, said, you know, I, I was young one time. And now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. He made an observation. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. When I was in India, I was in a place called Rajamundra, just, just below Calcutta. And it was abstract poverty. There's not a word to describe it. 
Every sense declared chaos. Human excrement, the smell of, of no toilets. When I got off the uh, sorry, the little wagon that they, a man pedaled on a bicycle, when I got off of that, he said, watch out for the dirt. And he meant human dirt. The smell was incredible. The Ganges River stopped. I, I, I spent an entire day weeping in my hotel room for the conditions in India. Absolutely weeping. Then I said to God in protest, I said, God, you've forsaken these people. Why? I lifted up a newspaper. Underneath the newspaper was a baby. Still alive. Eyes open. Couldn't even close them anymore. And flies walking on eyes. I saw people with no legs, no arms. I saw a man walking toward me. He was a tall, lanky Indian. And I thought at first it was a smile that he was presenting. And when I got closer, it leprosy had eaten his lips all the way. You saw his entire mouth and no lips. I remember I gave a few rupees to some children. That was it. I had to die in the back of a taxi cab. I remember when I dove into the back of the taxi cab and uh, sat back up, there was a little boy with two stumps pounding on my window. And I asked Brother Daniel that was set beside me, I said, how did he lose his arms? I thought he said leprosy. He says, no, the priest cut them off to make him a better beggar. Absolute chaos. And I said to God in my motel room, why? And it came to me very clearly, thou shalt have no other gods before me. They worship everything but the one true God. God would meet every one of their needs. But they have to, they have to this vanity and this ignorance to meet the Lord. And that's why we were in India. I remember the first sermon I preached in India. And they were all Hindus. A lot of Hindu priests were there. The, uh, if you remember the war during 47, their, their sort of friendly civil war. It was a war initially between Pakistan and India. They were, they were, they were both together. Remember Mahatma Gandhi um, tried to create a, a peaceful resolve and they created the state of the nation of Pakistan and the nation of India. So India remained predominantly Hindu, Pakistan predominantly Muslim. So I was, we were among a bunch of priests and, and their congregants. And I preached a basic salvation message like I did last week on the blood, on Calvary, on the cross, on who Jesus is. And they were appalled. They were appalled. There was a protest in the back of the room. I didn't know what was going on in the back of the room. We were in a big tent. And uh, the, 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 the OSHA would, would have shut them down in a heartbeat. There was this wire going from light bulb to light bulb to light bulb, all open, all exposed. There, we had cattle running through the tent. We had chickens running through the tent. The Brahmin bull is worshipped there. So you don't touch the Brahmin bull. He's worshipped there. So when whatever came through the tent, just came through the tent. He kept on preaching. Afterwards, this group over here that was protesting wanted to speak to us. And they said, what do you mean? That God would kill his own son, shed blood. See, everything there is possible potential for reincarnation. So you avoid the ant, the beetle, the bug, the serpent, the, the elf, everything's worshipped. Conveniently in India, the only thing that's not worshipped is chicken. <laughs> How amazing! <laughs> That they somehow the poor lowly fowl, the chicken, he was not a god. So I, for, for the time I was there, I ate curry chicken, curry chicken, curry chicken. And for a change of pace, I would eat chicken curry. So I, when I got done with the priests, I realized that their religion was actually created by Satan them away from a savior that could die and take our place and we could be absolutely forgiven. You understand the caste system? You understand the Hindu system? You have to work your way up. Highest rate of suicide is in India. Read the newspaper and it's a young single woman with master's degree looking for a young single man with, and then they have to, they have to declare their caste. 
And then you have, of course, the untouchables. They give away. They give away an extra kidney. They give away. They raise children to use them for body parts to sell to the hospitals and to individuals in the black market. It's another world. Well, what do they need? Jesus. They need to come out of their religion. They need an answer and a solution. And that solution, that answer is Christ. So we go from this lowly Jesus. And I always think of it this way. Remember when Peter and Jesus and John and they were up on the mountain. Peter, James, and John. And Jesus said, uh, he was talking to him on the Mount of Transfiguration. All of a sudden, Moses appeared and Elijah appeared, and Jesus was transfigured before them. And while, that, while Peter is watching this in astonishment, here's Moses, here's Elijah, and here's Jesus. I mean, the three greatest figures in a Jewish man's life. And he's, they're right there. And the Spirit, the, 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 the voice of God said, the same way in which you see Jesus here is the same way he will return. Well, he returns to the Jews in Revelation 11 with Moses and Elijah. So Jesus, the voice of God says the same way in which you see them now, they'll return. Well, what did Peter want to do? This was, this was an expression of something futuristic in the mind of God. Peter said, let's build three churches. One for Moses, one for Elisha, one for Jesus. That's man's nature. Take something supernatural and want to put it in a box. That's man's nature. Yes, amen. When it should have been left uninterpreted, untainted, and let it have been a glorious event and also let God interpret the future by bringing it to pass. But we are so quick to want to find false comfort in creating our boxes. So, why would a guy like myself leave everything I love and start all over again? It's church number three for me. Why would I do that? It's because sometimes you have to leave from without rather than leave from within. We try to leave from within. But when something becomes institutionalized, and how do you know something's becoming institutionalized? When the youth can no longer resonate with what's going on. You can't fool a youth. Intellectually, you can, because you have more years on them. But there's something hardwired in every human being that says, it's not right, it's not right, but I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. Because uh, these are all my elders and the people I respect. But something's not right. And then you feel like a rebel. You feel like there's something wrong with you. But in reality, what you're actually coming against, what your little spirit is, is fighting against, is a wrong form of authoritarianism. A wrong form of authoritarianism. Love versus authority. Love versus authoritarianism. That's the title of our message. Love versus authoritarianism. Because nobody's sat in the front row, I get to go a few more minutes. <laughs> so, the, the words associated with authoritarianism is, is repression, oppression, dictatorship, something like Hitler or Mussolini or Stalin or uh, you can name them all. And, uh, the law was a form of authoritarianism. The law, did you know that the law was a shadow mm -hmm. of things to come that were better? So it was a glory that had to be done away with. Yes. And that glory, that, that law was merely a taskmaster, a school teacher, but the Bible uses the word taskmaster, a school teacher, to run us to grace. Yes. Who ran? The woman that had fallen in sin, caught red-headed in adultery, who ran that woman to Jesus? The law did. The Sadducees and Pharisees ran her to Jesus. Thank God she knew where to go. 
And so we say, well, what a terrible thing. These religious leaders ready to cast stones and kill this woman, destroy her, break open her skull because she was caught in adultery. What happened to the man, by the way? You know, take two to tangle. They didn't bring him. Same crime, same sin. He should have been there being stoned too. Interesting religion that favored the man. Because it was religion. It wasn't God at all. Yes. Something that God was originally in, but it was his permissive will, not his perfect will. The law was never God's perfect will. But God's permissive will always makes way for the perfect will. Jonah got in a boat. Wanted to go to Nineveh, Tar Tarsha instead of Nineveh. But while he's in the boat, you say, well, man, he was out of the will of God. Well, yes, he was. He was running from God. He's supposed to be a prophet. He's supposed to go preach to Nineveh and say, repent or perish. But isn't it interesting in the permissive will of God that Jonah was a perfect type of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? And Jesus said, as Jonah was in the heart of the earth, so must the Son of Man suffer and rise the third day as Jonah came out of the belly of the whale. So the Jonah became a perfect shadow and type of the resurrected Christ. So the permissive will always makes a way for the perfect will. Moses smote the rock two times when he was supposed to speak to it. But Jesus then became the smitten rock in Hebrews. So he used that Old Testament shadow, which was the permissive will of God, as a perfect shadow of Jesus the smitten rock, which would provide the water. The living water through the deserts of our life. So it's showing us that it's chaos by design. We often see the chaos, but there's a perfect design to it. You take a, a mosaic, take a, a beautiful uh, rug that's been hand woven, and look on the front of the rug, and there's this beautiful pattern. Turn the rug around, and it's nothing but chaos. So somebody said, that's an ugly rock. Well, just turn it around. And you see something perfect. Something perfect. So we see the back side of the rock. God sees the front side. The pattern. You say, well, I don't see any pattern in my life. I see this, I see that. Well, it's because you're finite. But God's infinite. So, associated with the word authoritarianism is the word dictator or repression and oppression. I remember sitting in a restaurant the one downtown, I always forget the name of it, um, little coffee shop downtown, Martin Square. Meeting place. And I had a couple sisters from the church and a couple brothers. And over at another table was a bunch of Christian people, boys and girls, and they were very expressive about their faith. And they had shirts that mentioned something about their faith. Maybe they had just come from a rally. I don't know, but they were really excited. They were talking very uh, sweetly and very nicely with a tremendous amount of enthusiasm about Jesus and about the Bible. And they were each one comparing scriptures. Somebody had brought a Bible in. And somebody said to me, it was one of the girls, said to me, why are they so happy? Well, of course, my mind went to spin Here's a girl who's raised in church. She has long hair, long dress. She's obeyed whatever these strictures were. And then she looks over to them and says, why are they so happy? You know what she was really saying? Why are they so free? Why? How can they be free? They don't look right. They don't look right. But yet they're free. Well, they were absolutely free. They were absolutely uninhibited. They had met the Savior. Maybe he had a rally. Maybe he had a camp. Maybe he had a church meeting. And they were enthused. See, what happens with young teenage boys and girls when there's too much stricture, when there's too much of the sense of having to conform in order to please, to conform in order to be approved of is, is that a young boy and a young girl gets their eyes and their mind on what they have to become in order to be accepted. Where's the cross in that? 
Because the cross makes me accept. I'm accepted. You say, well, what about modesty? What about purity? What about holiness? What about, what about, what about, what about? A young boy or a young girl who meets the pure Savior over time becomes pure. A young boy or young girl who meets the Savior over time begins to live their life the way they know because they're hardwired. The way they know Christ wants them to live. So it, it, what happens to a, a pure move of God, we're going to build three booths and it's going to become touch not, taste not, handle not. Not, not, not. Before you know it, the, 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 a move of God turns into one big no. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. When the gospel means good news, it is one big yes. Jesus changes lives, not churches. Yes. Yes. And that's what I that's why I left. It's because I noticed that I saw that the church was trying to demand a certain level or standard that I was not willing to preach because I believe the standard is Jesus and Jesus changes the life. You just give somebody the word, and in the power of the Bible, in the Bible is the power to transform. Every seed has the power to transform itself from a seed to a tree to thousands of apples that will fall over the lifetime of that tree. It's within the power, within the seed is the power of transformation. When somebody receives God's word, within that seed word is the power of transformation. But often what keeps a young person away from receiving Jesus is they see all the don't, 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 don't. It becomes one big religion of no. Yeah. <laughs> Am I right, Lord? Yeah. <laughs> now, obviously, I'm on page one. Now, here I go again. First, read your Bible, Mark chapter 12. <laughs> I love this verse. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. You know when we say things like building a church from the ground up, we're not referring to a building, are we? We're referring to a body of believers. We're referring to, sometimes as believers all of our life, we have to do what? We have to unlearn. We have to unlearn. And you know what? Sometimes taking somebody who's in the world, totally a sinner, never known Jesus, and they get to come to church for the first time. They don't have to unlearn anything. And they just go through the natural process of gratitude for salvation. So happy to be baptized, and everybody's on the shore of the, of the, of the pond, and they're rejoicing with them. And they're so fresh and innocent and new. But then if you're raised in church, so often... It's like, oh, I know when I get to a certain age, I'll have to do this or I have to do that. And there's so many preconceptions that stop a young boy or young girl from committing their life to Jesus. So it's so important for me as a minister and you as parents to in make sure. Let me just say this too. Sometimes you even have to protect your children from the religion within your own church. You have to protect your children from the religion within your own church. And that doesn't mean you leave the church. It means that you make sure you become a balance within your home and say, hey, wait a minute. That evangelist that came through, honey, yeah, this is what he said. We're not going to eat the evangelist for dinner. But I'm just saying, honey, that's not the way we run our house. He was using a lot of fear and intimidation, a lot of rhetoric. He was very loud, and I know you're a little frightened, but he's still doing his job. The evangelist is maybe, he's appealing to one person over here who's stubborn and willful, but knows he needs to get a start to God. And I might be dealing with him through the voice of that evangelist. So don't always apply it to yourself, honey, as if that's the way it is. So the mother the father begins to bring balance to the children. And it's a delicate thing. You don't tear down proper authority, but you bring balance when something is a little bit askew. 
So look at this in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes came having heard them reasoning. So there was a bunch of people around Jesus. There were lawyers, scribes, Pharisees, all the religious leaders. So another man came by having heard them reasoning together and perceived that he had answered them well and asked him, what is the first commandment of all? The lawyer, a lawyer is what they, we know what a lawyer is today, but a lawyer in the Old Testament was a, a studier of the law. So he had studied the first five books of the Bible. He, was a, he understood the Pentateuch very well. He was a studier of the law. So he was called a lawyer. So this lawyer comes to Jesus and says, what's the, first, what's the most important commandment? So he, he didn't say, like, what's the first commandment? Thou shalt love uh, the Lord, or the hero is the Lord, our God is one Lord. He wanted to know what's the most preeminent, what's the most predominant, what's the most important, what, what thematically really is the what overall picture of why God exists, why the fall, why the law, what's the most important? Think. And Jesus says this. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, that's commandment number one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is likely like namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So what Jesus is saying here is there's not a greater principle to live by than love God and love your neighbor. Yes. There's not a greater principle to live by. You would have every jail would be empty. There would be no need for a judicial system. No judges, no police force of people who would love God and love their neighbor. Now, I want you to notice how he tells us to love him. He tells us to love him with our mind. He also tells us to love him with our strength. That means the energy that God gives us, the resources that God gives us, the, the, the anything that we do in life is supposed to be for God's glory. With all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Soul doesn't just mean that inner compartment on the inside of you. Soul means with everything that's within you. With all thy soul. With everything that's within you. That's your breath. That's your life. With everything that's within you. And, and secondly to that, just as important, and the, the knowledge that I know that I'm loving God properly is because I can love my neighbor as myself. Jesus said, if you say you love God who we have not seen, but hate your neighbor whom you have seen, then you don't know how to love God yet. So how do I love God? I love God by loving my neighbor. I love God by pulling off the side of the road and helping that individual. I love God by helping a stranger. We know the story of the Good Samaritan. The man tempting Jesus said, who's my neighbor? He said, well, there's a stranger down the road. And he was uh, uh, robbed by criminals, and he, they beat him up. He's half dead, and Pharisee walked on one side of the street, Sadducee on the other, and here comes a Samaritan. He sees the poor guy, and he says, wow, I, I need to help you. So he gets off of his horse. He does whatever he can to help him. He doesn't have a cell phone, can't call 911, so he says, I'll take you to a motel. So there he gets some oil, some wine, some something to bandage up his wounds, and he tells the, key, the keeper of the hotel, you take care of him, and I'll return tomorrow. Whatever bills he amasses, I'll take care of it. I want to get this guy back on his feet. That's my neighbor, Jesus said. Who's my neighbor? A total stranger. Glory to God, I like that. That's challenging. That's challenging. Now, let's go on and look at this now. Verse 31 says, And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none greater than these. Verse 32. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. Number one. And to love him. I want you to see how he translates what Jesus just said. And to love him with all the heart. 
Jesus said, mind, he says, and with all your understanding, and with all the soul. Jesus says, body, he says, and with all your strength. And to love his neighbor as himself. Watch what this man says. Is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. What was he saying? He was saying all the animal sacrifices since the Garden of Eden, when Abel offered the first animal sacrifice, since all the tens of thousands of animal sacrifices, to love God and neighbor is more than all that ritual, all that form, all that process. Can you imagine a young girl, a young boy, being raised in church all their life, and ever so often somebody offers a lamb, offers a lamb, offers a lamb, offers a turtle dove, offers a sheep goat, offers a ram, and that little girl finally gets to the age and says, Mom, what's, what, why do they do that? Well, that little girl was raised in church, and she doesn't even know why. Why are they doing that? So the mom and the dad stop and say, well, what are they doing? why do we do that? Oh, it's God's covering our sin through the animal sacrifice. So it can become so a part of you, a part of the form of life, that we even forget the original intent. So why do I come to church? Why do I bring my family? And why does a preacher preach? And why do we sing songs? Because there's an inside guy. There's a body, there's a spirit, there's a soul. And that inside person has to be fed as well. The outside guy gets fed, gets clothed, gets, stays warm in the, in the winter and in, 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 in inclement temperatures. Everything's conditioned. But there's an inside person that needs feeding, caring for. So we preach the word, we pray, we worship together, we feed the inside man. See, we often say, you know, this is, this is my body. The reason we say that is because the body is inferring that it's, it's, there's something that we possess. See, you're not a body. You're a soul. You just live in a body. One in a body will pass away. But the soul will go to its destiny. And how do I know where the soul's going to go? It depends entirely about where your affections are, what you're feeding on, what you're going on. So you become what you eat. You eat junk food. You die young. You smoke a lot, drink a lot. You die young. You become what you eat. So you eat healthy, you take care of yourself. It's a good chance you're going to live to be older. We all are a product of what we bring into our body, and that determines how long we're going to be able to live and enjoy a quality life. Now, he goes on to say this, and then we're going to have to close. He says, and he repeats Jesus, and he says, it's more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw, then he answered wisely, discreetly, with humility, Jesus said unto him, Thou, to this lawyer, you are not far from the kingdom of God. This lawyer understood, cut through all the fact, all the religion, all the commandments, all the, the 767 or 68 commandments, all the laws and bylaws, cut through all of that, that lawyer had the ability to say, really it boils down to loving God and loving man. And Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no man bothered to ask him any more questions. Now, I want to leave you with this. What is the source, the root, the genesis of God's power? Now, stay with me for just a moment. What do you mean by that? God is power. But what's the source of his power? Because God has a source. What's the source of his power? Well, Superman was Krypton, right? I think. No, what was it? Kryptonite. Kryptonite. Yeah. Thanks. 
Spider-Man, I think it was uh, what cross-species genetics. He got bit by a spider. So that was his source of power. And Popeye, that's my day. And that was spinach. And every time he's getting beat up, uh, what was her name? Olive oil. A little skinny olive oil would throw him some spinach. He'd eat that and he'd save the day. Save all oil. He can't save all oil. So what's the root of God's power, the genesis of God's power? I'll tell you what it is. It's love. God's power is love. Now, think about this for a moment. Remove love from God. You would have a force. You would have authoritarianism. You would have a pope. You would have a dictator. Remove love from God and you would have religion. A form of authoritarianism. And you would line up or else. That's what the law was all about. Line up or else. But you've got to remember, God never foisted the law upon man. Exodus 19, man asked for a law. Man asked for a law. God never said, I'm going to take you to a mountain and give you a law. They were to go to the mountain and meet God. Man asked for the law. So the power, the, the, the source of God's power, that, that what emanates from God, that's what makes God God, is love. Had God not had love, everything that would be created would eventually be destroyed. Because God wouldn't have the capacity without love to build something that could actually have the qualities to live forever. Why is that? Because man would kill man. There would always be coups. There would always be church splits. There would always be hate. There would always be wars. So Jesus comes along and says, don't be overcome of evil. Overcome evil with good. Love your enemy. Pray for them that despitefully use you, persecute you, say all manner of evil against you. Falsehood. That was earth shaking. Roman tyranny. Pilate had been partly responsible. Herod had been partly responsible. The masses were calling out, crucify him. But really, what actually did bring about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Religion. Religion killed Christ. Sadducees and Pharisees killed Christ. Religion killed Christ. Now, so God's power is love. Without love, it can only end in evil. Love is what makes God God. Makes God meek. Makes God gentle. Makes God kind. And makes the mighty God the Lamb. Makes him God. God identifies with two creatures to refer to Himself and His Son: dove and lamb. Not lion, not tiger. Dove and lamb. So authoritarianism is an outside force that demands conformity, or you will feel shame. Or you will feel regret. Whereas the Holy Spirit is an inside force that the Bible calls the comforter. It refers to it as the dove that descended upon Christ, the Spirit of God. I want you to think of the voice of God as a dove. Ever hear a morning dove? It's a beautiful sound. I love the morning dove. I love to hear the morning dove. It's peaceful. It's gentle. And that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. We see, we, we confuse power, which God has, and we confuse power with political power, religious power, power of corrupt companies or governments. Or, but when we use the power referring to Christ, think of meekness, temperance, patience, godliness, Brotherly kindness. That's God. God is that. Now, next Sunday, I want 
us to see the wisdom of God and how that He will transfer His love right into our lives. But the greatest nemesis, the greatest antagonist, the greatest enemy to receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving the love, is religion. It's not you. It's religion itself. And so we have to break away the, 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 uh, all of the, uh, the things that appear to be right, all of the stage and the platform and, and, and all of that, and remove it all away to where it's just you and Jesus. So I would say, as I would say to myself every day, when I'm anxious, when I'm worried, when I'm upset, when I'm nervous, you find a place in, the, in, the, in your house to pray. And you're going to meet a gentle Savior. A, a wonderful God. He's not a tyrant. He's a, he's, a, he's a wonderful man. In fact, I will devote the rest of my life and my energies trying to absorb, soak up Jesus Christ. That's fire. Right. Elijah, in the cave, heard the thunder, the lightning, saw the fire, the whirlwind, but God wasn't in any of it. Then Elijah heard a still small voice. Elijah, 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 I want to speak to you, Elijah. See, the end for us, is love. The end for us is an ever unfolding love, an eternal love. A world of love. No hate, no pain, no wars. The end for us is love. And God is perfecting His love in us. That's why we have fallen bodies. Because you can't love in a glorified body. Somebody can wrong you, you're in a glorified body doesn't hurt. It doesn't, there's no emotion. Somebody can hate you. You don't hate back in a glorified body. You've got a God body. But it's in this body that you feel the sickly emotions, the restrictions, the feelings of rejection. It's in this body that you learn to love. It may sound strange to you, but only in disability can we rise to love. It's perfect strength by perfect weakness. It's perfect strength by perfect weakness. I acknowledge my weakness and he gives me his strength. Father God, a simple Sunday sermon in humble surroundings. Oh God, you're great. You're awesome. And you're all wise. I thank you for these humble beginnings where you can build a new in every one of our hearts and our children's hearts and our lives. You can become the preeminent one because we offer you that position. I offer you the position in my heart as Master and Lord. And I'm not afraid to do that. I know you're careful. I know you're understanding. And I know that you understand our frailty. Lord, I would pray for every heart here that their level of trust will rise. Their level of faith in God will rise. And they'll begin to pray. Call on God as one who is a friend. As one who is a comforter. Lord Jesus, Make us like you. We want to be like you. Everything in us desires to have you living out your thoughts, actions, and deeds through our body. So do a complete work in us, Lord, as we pray and ask you, Lord God, come in. Dwell in us. Take sanctuary in us. 
speak to us. Heal to us. Save to us. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, we press on. Wow.